throughout the Pacific area and Asia, liberated people celebrated in wild rejoicing. For well, these were the hours of reckoning and of rescue. Rescue, not alone for oppressed peoples, but also for allied prisoners of war who had endured hardships and atrocities in hundreds of PW camps. Survivors of Bataan and Wing, Singapore and Hong Kong, men from ships sunk at sea or planes shot down in combat, awakened at last from a nightmare of hunger and brutality. The world, already shocked at the horrors of German concentration camps, shuddered as Japanese barbed wire gave up its living dead. The savagery, filth, and starvation were reminiscent of the death camps at Buchenwald and Belsen. Victims brought forth the living evidence of beating with bats, rifle butts, and bamboo rods. Red Cross packages were nearly all stolen by the guards. Death claimed many of the 200,000 Allied prisoners. But for those who lived to see the day of liberation, there was freedom at last. And cheering news for thousands of homes the world over. Owing to the Jap trick of not reporting numerous Allied prisoners, men long believed dead could now flash the happy word of their survival. rescued were moved from the Japanese shore to waiting hospital ships. For them, even more than for their comrades in arms, the victory was complete. Yes, victory was complete. Now Japan, a prisoner of the United Nations, was to learn the meaning of submission. Her armies were disarmed and disbanded. Her weapons destroyed her war leaders on trial for their lives. The flag that ruled Japan was no longer the rising sun. And the supreme authority had passed from a Jap known as Hirohito to an American named MacArthur. A new day had dawned for Japan, a grim day of disillusionment and hardship, of hard work and atonement for its crimes against the world. Yet, even for guilty Japan, there was hope. For VJ Day was, in a way, a day of victory for the people of Japan, too. It meant liberation from the military overlords, the feudal system, and warlike ideals that had led them to give fanatical devotion to a hopeless, costly war. Even as a conquered enemy, Jap is enjoying greater freedom under his new bosses than he had ever known under his native rulers. Greater freedom to read and write different political opinions, to argue and criticize on public street corners, on the air, by petition, and by the ballot. It is neither softness nor laxity on our part. It is instead a carefully guided and supervised revolution in the Japanese way of life. Even as we cleared the rubble from his devastated cities, we are purging his mind of narrow, fanatical, war-breeding ideas. He is being given his first taste of freedom of the mind, the freedom that is the breath of democracy, the freedom that will give his children a chance at a better way of life than poverty or war. For only by learning the blessings of the democratic way will he acquire a permanent will to peace, end the threat of another war for conquest, end our long, costly job of occupation. The signs after a year are encouraging. The Japanese people, stricken for centuries by a drought of freedom, have responded thirstily to the opportunities offered them by their conquerors. The impassive little yellow man, known to the West as the inscrutable Oriental, has received these changes eagerly. Hirohito himself is a symbol of these changes in Japanese life. The man who had accepted the reverence of his people as divine now walks humbly among them, fraternizing, 
eager to prove that he is not a god, but very much a man. Even more significant and encouraging to Western eyes is the new dignity and freedom for Japanese women. Not only do they now vote, but they have elected one of their own sex, modest Takuchi Shigeo, who, like a good housewife, was tilling her vegetable garden when the good news came. The Japanese have shown great adaptability to the material side of Western civilization, in factories and machines, in the architecture of his public buildings and homes, in clothing. Now there is strong hope that they may learn and believe in the Western ideals of peace and freedom, that they may respond to the words of the man most instrumental to that day of victory, who said, It is my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. A world founded upon faith and understanding. A world dedicated to the dignity of man and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish for freedom, tolerance, and justice.